Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to God's house on this first Sunday in Lent. Our overall theme based on the scripture lessons these Sundays in Lent is rethinking religion. A lot of people have a lot of different ideas about God and religion, but that doesn't mean that they're necessarily right. Um, and so we're going to look at some of the different uh, aspects of that. Today we're going to rethink trials, tests, and temptations. A lot of people immediately think of those things as bad, but we're going to see that God is able to use them for our good. He can he uses tests as a way to get us to focus less on ourselves and more on Him. He takes uh, trials to teach us that this sinful world is not our final home. And he even takes Satan temptations and can use them for our good. Because while Satan would want to use them to draw us away from God, God can use them to draw us closer to him and more dependent on his word. Um, and so that's going to be our focus this morning. Uh, we'll begin with him 404. Jesus grant that balm and healing.
guy for worship, basically setting one on page 154 in the hymnal or on the screen, with a, a slight variation when we get to the Gloria, and I'll announce that. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to the Lord. Holy Amen. God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave up his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. In place of the glory be to God, we sing the first two verses today of A Lamb Goes Uncomplaining Forth, hymn 422.
Mighty God and Father, our Lord Jesus walked into the wilderness to face the devil's temptation, but he did not succumb to Satan's lies or falter in his resolve to save the world from the prison of hell. Bolster our faith by his mighty victory that we may battle against the forces of evil with courage and confidence through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated. Our first reading and sermon text for today, Genesis 22, beginning at verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He called to him, Abraham. Abraham answered, I'm here. God said, now take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him heat there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains there, the one to which I direct you. Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, along with Isaac, his son. Abraham split the wood for the burnt offering. Then he sent out to go to the place that God had told him about. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place in the distance. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go on over there. We will worship and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and loaded it on Isaac, his son. He took the fire pot and the knife in his hand. The two of them went down together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father? He said, I hear my son. He said, Here are the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So the two of them went on together. They came to the place that God had told them about. Abraham built the altar there. He arranged the wood, tied up Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. The angel of the Lord called to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. Abraham said, I am here. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy. Do not do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. Abraham looked around and saw that behind him there was a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. So it is said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord it will be provided. The angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, I have sworn by myself, declared the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will bless you greatly. And I will multiply your descendants greatly, like the stars of the sky and like the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will take possession of the city gates of their enemies. In your seed, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. The word of the Lord. Amen. Our psalm for today is Psalm 25b, either in the printed in the worship uh, guide or uh, on the screen. I lift my soul to you.
read Romans chapter 8, beginning at verse 31. The proof of God's love for us is not that he removed all our troubles. The proof of God's love to us is that he gave his son. And if he did that, then nothing else can separate us from God's love. What then will we say about these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Indeed, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also graciously give us all things along with him? Who will bring an accusation against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus, who died, and more than that, was raised to life, is the one who is at God's right hand and who is also interceding for us. What will separate us from the love of Christ? Will trouble or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. Knowing all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, neither things present or things to come, nor powerful forces, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand for the gospel acclamation. tempted by Satan. He was with the wild animals, and the angels were serving him. After John was put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee, preaching the gospel of the kingdom of God. The time is fulfilled, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the gospel. The gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord Christ. Please be seated. We continue by singing the hymn of the day, 863, A Mighty Fortress is Our God.
home in the Ur of Chaldeans. He had been training Abraham in his faith. Now came the final test. God told Abraham to do the unthinkable. Now take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Offer him there as a bird offering on one of the mountains there, the one to which I direct you. Now from our vantage point, we know what God was up to, but Abraham did. He didn't know that this was only a test. All Abraham knew is that God was commanding him to offer his son Isaac as a human sacrifice. And that didn't make any sense at all. This was the son whom Abraham had waited 25 years to be born. This was the son born to Abraham and Sarah in their old age, well beyond childbearing years. This was the only son for whom God's promises were to be fulfilled. Promises like becoming a great nation, descendants like sand on the seashore. And now God was commanding Abraham to kill him and offer him as a sacrifice. Everything about this command seemed contrary to God's ways. Human sacrifices were a heathen practice, not the practice of those who called on the name of the Lord. God's command went against everything that Abraham knew about God and against everything God had promised to him. But even more significantly, this son Isaac was the one whom God promised to bless all peoples on earth through whom the promised Savior would come. And that's what makes this command of God even more puzzling, isn't it? Why would God want Abraham to kill the very one through whom the Savior was coming? Not only did this command seem to violate Abraham's love as a father for his son, but it also seemed to cut off all of Abraham's hope for salvation as well. To Abraham, it must have seemed that if God's command was destroying God's promise. Luther accurately described Abraham's predicament when he said, To human reason, it must have seemed either that God's promise would fail, or else this command must be of the devil and not God. So what do you do when, you, when God is opposite of what you expect him to be? What did Abraham do? He clung to the promise of God. Now, this test had come out of the clear blue. Remember, Abraham had been in God's classroom, so to speak. He had finally learned at his old age to take God at his word and trust him. Earlier in his life, he would have failed miserably, and he did. But now he was ready. God knew that. And ultimately, isn't that what faith is? Taking God at his word when everything else seems to say otherwise. Faith takes God at his word to provide and brings a generous offering to the Lord first, even when conventional wisdom tells you to pay yourself first. Faith takes God at his word and follows it even when everyone else is following the world. Faith takes God at his word even when your human reason tells you otherwise. Abraham clung to faith in God's promise even when everything said otherwise. Understand, God did not need to test Abraham's faith to know that it was real. Several chapters earlier, we read that God credited Abraham's faith to him for righteousness. God didn't test Abraham's faith for God's sake. He tested it for Abraham's sake, to exercise it, to strengthen it. And he did it for our sake, so that we might see Abraham's faith also as an example. And God still tests the faith of his people to strengthen and purify it. No two situations in life will be the same, but there are many striking similarities between Abraham, who God called our forefather, 
and we who are Abraham's spiritual children. God still tests our faith in the furnace of hardship and suffering. Like gold in a refiner's fire, like steel tempered in a blazing furnace. He tests our faith that he creates in us to strengthen us, it, to refine it. He closes his hand of blessing and leaves us in the wilderness alone with only his word. And then he dares us to believe that that word is sure and certain, even though everything else seems to say otherwise. God tests the faith he creates in us to strengthen it, to harden it, like a blacksmith forging a sword for battle. He does that through various trials and troubles. The problem is, is that in our day and age of sugary, sweet Christianity, it's easy to forget this. And in all truth, we would rather not know about this fact of the faith, would we? We would rather have the Christian faith be an easy life on easy street, without pain, without suffering, without sacrifice, without testing. We are, we are so impatient, we would rather mortgage the future to possess the present. And we certainly don't do well with ambigu ambiguity, right? We want life spelled out for us clearly, preferably before we sign on the dotted line. We want to know exactly what we're getting into. We expect God to explain himself completely when he asks us to suffer and sacrifice. We expect him to explain to us completely when we lose our house, goods, fame, child, or spouse. Because that's not what we signed up for. Why are these things happening to me? What did I do to deserve this? We want God to behave like we want him to behave, right? We find the God who tests our faith to be too, too troubling, to be too unpredictable. We want a safer God. We want a tame God, a, a, a soft and cuddly God that we could put in the box. We want a God that we can manage and make do things our way. So what do you do when God's not predictable, not pain, but actually looks to be your own worst enemy? What do you do when you aren't sure whether you're dealing with the divine or the devil? I've always found it interesting that the Hebrew, both the Hebrew word and the Greek word for test or tempt is the exact same word. So how do you tell the difference? That is the thing, you, you don't. On the surface, they both look the same, they feel the same. All you have is God's Word to tell you the difference. God will test you, but he'll never tempt you. You see, the difference between testing and tempting is not the circumstance, but the one who's doing it and the reason they're doing it. Testing comes from God for, the per for, for our good, for the purpose of strengthening and refining our faith. Tempting comes from the devil with the evil purpose of weakening and ultimately destroying our faith. So what do you do when it seems like God is your own worst enemy? When you aren't sure whether you're dealing with the divine or the devil. When God asks you to put your son, the son of the promise, on an altar and slay him as a sacrifice. Well, we know what Abraham did. From Abraham, God got no back talk, no argument, not even questioning, only obedience. Abraham got up early in the morning, saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, along with Isaac, his son. Abraham split the wood for the burnt offering, then he set out to go to the place that God had told him about. It took three days for them to get there. I would imagine those were the longest three days of Abraham's life. Can you imagine that agony as he turned over and over in his mind what God was actually telling him to do? I mean, if he sacrificed his son Isaac, how was God going to keep all his promises to him? To the whole world of sinners? When Abraham finally got to the mountain, he left his servants behind. Stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Did Abraham believe that? 
Or was he just saying that so his servants wouldn't try to stop him? Abraham took the wood for the burnt offering and loaded it on his son Isaac. He took the fire pot and the knife in his hand. The two of them went on together. As they were walking, Isaac looks around and he begins to realize something's missing. Here are the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? That question must have cut Abraham to the heart. And in his reply, we see Abraham both considerate love, who spared his son all the gory details, but also Abraham's confident faith, which lets the outcome to God. God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. To understand, Abraham had no idea how, when, or where God was going to do that. But he trusted him to do so. He knew God would be true to his promise. God's word is sure, and Abraham was certain of it. So he took God at his word, even if he could not see beyond the wood, the fire, the altar, and his son. Isn't that what faith is? Being sure of things hoped for, certain of things we cannot see. We asked earlier, did Abraham believe it when he told his servants, we will worship and then we will come back to you? Did Abraham believe it when he told Isaac, God will himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering? Well, we have our answer in Hebrews chapter 11 in the New Testament. We're told that Abraham, yes, did believe that. We're told that Abraham believed even if God would have him slay Isaac. He, quote, reasoned that God also had the ability to raise him from the dead. Abraham believed God's word, confident God would be faithful to it, even if it meant raising Isaac from the dead. Abraham took God at his word to the point of tying his son up, placing him on an altar, and raising that knife up above his son to plunge it in. What an anguish, anguish-filled moment. When faith and unbelief are engaged in struggle. When heaven and hell look indistinguishable from each other. Disregarding everything that his heart and head told him, Abraham focused only on God's promise. His muscles tense, ready to obey God's command no matter how thinkable, no matter how unbearable, no matter how unreasonable. If there was any conflict between God's command and God's promise, that was God's business. But Abraham was going to do what God commanded him to do no matter what. And then came the voice of the angel of the Lord. The pre-incarnate Son of God, second person of the Trinity before he became permanently God in the flesh at Bethlehem. Calling out his name, Abraham, Abraham, do not lay your hand on the boy, do not do anything to him, for now I know that you fear God, because you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. You see, God wasn't interested in the death of Isaac, but only in the willingness of Abraham's faith. Faith has been described as the yes of the heart. Faith sees nothing but the word of God and clings to it. By faith, Abraham was willing to do what God commanded, to surrender and sacrifice Isaac. And in so doing, he showed that he feared God. To fear God is, to, is more than to be afraid of God. It, it's the idea of having reverential trust in God, which includes unflinching commitment to his word. To fear God is to place God's word and command above the word and command of anyone else, even one's own heart and mind. That's what Abraham did, didn't he? God tested Abraham's faith, and he placed past with flying colors. There was nothing that Abraham was going to withhold from the Lord. He would even give up his own son, the son of the promise, if that's what the Lord wanted. There was no command of the Lord that Abraham, his servant, would not obey. There was no one and nothing that Abraham feared, loved, and trusted in God above God. Abraham was ready and willing to offer Isaac as a sacrifice, but God wouldn't let him. He didn't have to because Abraham already showed 
that in his heart he had surrendered and sacrificed Isaac. And there in that thicket was a ram caught by its horns. God did exactly what Abraham said he would do, right? God provided a ram for the sacrifice. The ram would be sacrificed instead of Isaac. Now it's tempting to make this account into we should all be like Abraham. But that would be incomplete. Again, remember, this was at the end of Abraham's instruction time. This account of Abraham and Isaac gives us something more. It gives us a picture of our own salvation and what God has done for us. In Abraham, we see the love that the Heavenly Father has had for us. If there was anyone that ever in a small way could understand what went on in the heart of God, it was Abraham, right? Although God spared Abraham's son, God did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. One of the great things of Lent is Jesus' work as our substitute. And just as God provided that ram to be sacrificed instead of Isaac, so in a greater way he provided Jesus as the Lamb of God to be sacrificed in the place of all of us. Jesus is that Lamb, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. God placed him on the wood of the cross. And while Abraham showed his love for God by willing, being willing to offer his son at God's command, God shows his love for Abraham and for the rest of us sinners by actually offering his son as a sacrifice, the once for all sacrifice for sins. God made Jesus, who had no sin, to be literally the sin offering for us. And you and I, we're Isaac, aren't we? We face death every day, whether we want to admit it or not. We heard we are being put to death all day long from our second reading. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. That's not a pleasant picture, but it's an accurate one of our life on earth, isn't it? The law of God has us bound to the firewood. The commandments bind us to the altar. The death sentence prescribed by the law hangs over us just like that knife hung over Isaac. The wages of sin is death. We feel it in our bones. Our consciences tell us it's true. There's no way out. We have broken God's law. We deserve to die. God is justified in slaying us and engulfing us in the fire of his wrath. But then Christ steps in and intervenes. He stops the night from plunging. He holds back the condemnation of the law and the death sentence. He does so by flawlessly keeping the law for us and by taking all of the, the law's prescribed punishments for us. The ram caught by the horns in the thicket is a picture of our Savior. He's God's lamb, caught on the wood of the cross, pinned there by our sins and guilt. God provided the lamb for the sacrifice. And just as God provided that ram for sacrifice so Isaac could live, so he has provided Jesus, his son, as the perfect lamb of God for the sacrifice so that we would all live. Where's the lamb? See him on the cross, the lamb of God for sinners slain. Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. What a pity name. Do you realize that later Mount Moriah would be where the temple was built in Jerusalem? Where God would provide access to his Old Testament people through the offering of many other lambs and animals for sacrifice? And of course, all those animal sacrifices only had their value in the, from the sacrifice which they looked forward to, the once for all sacrifice of God's lamb. And that sacrifice of that Jesus made would take place in the shadow of that temple. There suspended between heaven and earth was the substitute for sinners God himself had provided. In Christ, God gives us more than we expect, more than we realize, more than we could ever ask. God tested Abraham. God tests us. Which means right now, if your life is fairly comfortable, 
Rejoice. Give thanks to God for the respite. But realize it's just that. It's a, a momentary break. Because you will be tested. You can count on it. I don't know what form that testing will come, but it will come. It could be financial difficulty, emotional distress, physical disease. It could be betrayal by a friend or a death of a family member. It might be a situation where you are forced to choose between what you want and what God wants. Now maybe this isn't what you want to hear. I get it. Testing is never fun. But it's not supposed to be. God, uh, Abraham was not having fun at Mount Moriah. In times of testing, God may seem distant, maybe even appear as your enemy. Those closest to you may avoid you. You will feel isolated, isolated and alone. And all you will have is God's word. And then God dares you to believe that that word is sure and true, no matter what everything else seems to say. But his word is enough. For you have this promise from him. God is faithful. He will not allow you to be tested beyond your ability, but when he tests you, he will also bring about the outcome so that you are able to bear it. Even in your testing, know God has something good in mind for you. He's working towards your eternal salvation. He's working towards raising you to eternal life on the last day. God is putting to death the sinner and raising to life the saint, awakening your faith in Christ, testing it, tempering it, to make it even stronger. That's why God tests you. So that you learn to rely less on yourself and rely more on Him. So that you loosen your grasp on the things of this world so you can tighten your grasp on the treasures of heaven. So that you take your eyes off this world and realize where your real home is. So that you learn to trust the Lord to provide. He has provided. His Son is the Lamb for the sacrifice. And baptized into Him, believing in Him, He will provide you with everything else you really need. Believe it. You have a word on it. Amen. Please stand. We continue by confessing our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the worlds to come. Amen. Please be seated for the prayer of the church. The prayer of the church is printed in your service guide or on the street. Lord our God, we trust in you. Our eyes always look to you. Only you can release our feet from temptation snare. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. You cannot be tempted by evil, nor do you tempt anyone. Strengthen us to withstand all temptation, so that we may overcome and win the victory with you. Lead us not into temptation. But deliver us from evil. Your son Jesus resisted the temptations of Satan by the power of your word. Let that same word spread throughout the world. Let your saving gospel reach those held under the power of the devil and free them from the misery of sin. Lead us not into temptation. 
but deliver us from evil. Your son Jesus said, things that cause people to stumble are bound to come, but woe to anyone through whom they come. Guide, guard, and keep us steadfast in your word and in the Christian faith so that we never tempt others to sin. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Look on Christians around the world who face temptations, trials, and persecutions because of their faith. Keep them from all harm and danger. Keep your word in their hearts and on their lips. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Turn and be gracious to those who are lonely or afflicted, who suffer pains of body, soul, or mind. Relieve their distress and free them from anguish. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And now hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petition. Lord God, Heavenly Father, since that evil spirit, the devil, always prowls around like a roaring lion seeking to devour us, shield us by your dear holy angels from all his coming and terror for your dear son's sake. Through your Holy Spirit, give us repentant hearts that we may serve you in all soberness and vigilance. Through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, our Lord. Amen. And now, motivated by God's grace, and we receive the gift of God's people to God's altar. We sing two verses of When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. <laughs> Our substitute under your holy law, 
who destroyed the works of the devil by his perfect obedience to your will, who willingly carried a cross to pay the debt of the world's sin, who lives and reigns to give us life. Through his body and blood, once given and poured out for us, forgive our sins and strengthen us for our journey heavenward. Unite us to our crucified and risen Lord, that we may believe in him, confess him, call on his name, and finally be delivered from this world to the peace of the Lamb, whose kingdom has no end. And in his name we also join to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Amen. the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Please remain standing to sing 951, Lord, and I'll let your servant.
uh, keep the fun by the foot. The uh, uh, flooring project in the uh, parish hall and basement. Um, the uh, new medications are available uh, now. Um, we also do have a few large prints, okay? Uh, so if you uh, need that, uh, uh, make use of those. Um, pizza fundraiser information, uh, School of Outreach, we're still looking for uh, some more people to attend, so please consider that. And then if you look at the, uh, um, this week at Grace, just one correction, uh, we will not have Food and Faith this coming Wednesday. Uh, we will have our midweek Lent service at 12 and 7, uh, as we will throughout the entire season of Lent, uh, but there will be no supper at uh, whatever, 6 or 8. So, um, you'll have, you're on your own for supper. So. Um, but come and, be, come and feast on the Word uh, at noon or 7. Uh, and don't forget to fill out your uh, cue cards. Red for visitors, black for members. Thank you, David.